addressed by, on, by our Honorable Vice Chancellor, and keynote addressed by Honorable Chancellor, followed by student interaction. Poised to be a symphony of inspiration and encouragement as we listen to their profound insights and engage in insi insightful conversation. Once again, I welcome you all to this esteemed visit of our Honorable Chancellor to Nalanda University. We also welcome to our all distinguished guests, most respected deans, faculty members, administration, other university officials, and our cherished students of Nalanda University on this momentous occasion, marking the esteemed visit of the Honorable Chancellor to Nalanda University. Now, without taking any more time, I would like to request our Honorable Chancellor, Professor Arvind Parvindia ji, and Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor Abhay Kumar Singh ji, to kindly come forward and take their seat on the dais. Please welcome them amidst us with a resounding sound of applause. Thank you, sir. To commence now, to commence the esteemed occasion with auspiciousness, I cordially invite our Honorable Chancellor and Honorable Vice Chancellor to lead us in the ceremonial act of illuminating the lamp. Honorable Chancellor of Nalanda University, Professor Arvind Pangadia Ji, and Honorable Vice Chancellor of the University, Professor Abhay Kumar Singh Ji. Lighting a lamp is a cherished tradition that symbolizes the commencement of a journey towards enlightenment and prosperity, dispelling the darkness of ignorance through illuminating the light of wisdom. Let us all join, the, join them in the spirit of fostering peace and unity amongst all with a resounding applause. Thank you, Honorable Chancellor, sir, and Honorable Vice Chancellor, sir. Going forward now, it's the time to express our gratitude and regard to our Honorable Chancellor. For that, I would like to request our Honorable Vice Chancellor to kindly felicitate our Honorable Chancellor of Nalanda University, Professor Arvind Pangadia ji, by presenting Angavast. <coughs> Please give them a resounding applause. <coughs> we express our gratitude for, the, for his unwavering commitment and dedication to the advancement of education and research. Thank you, sir. Now I would like to request Honorable Vice Chancellor of Nalanda University, Shri Abhay Kumar Singh Ji, with his great wealth of wisdom and experience to deliver the welcome address. Please join me in welcoming sir with a round of applause. Honorable Chancellor, sir and all Nalanda community. I am sharing the views and the expressions of the entire Nalanda community, sir. And today is a great day for us. We are delighted. It's, it's a great honor to welcome you in the campus of Nalanda University, sir. And First and foremost, I would say that since you have taken over as the chancellor of this university, there has been a great inspiration that is prevailing right from the top to the bottom and all around. Since we have here one of the greatest academicians and economists of renown, who has, with his knowledge and the power of his knowledge, his intellectual heights and the insights, the depth in the subject, a professor for 40 years in the most renowned university in the US, who established his credentials so high that the government off and on has been seeking your advice, sir, your consultations, your directions, your guidance, 
in framing the policy. So here, what a big inspiration we get to see you, to be with you. You're coming to this campus that the power of learning can keep a person to such big heights, to such positions of high authority. And with your simplicity, sir, I think your modesty, it is, I think it is exemplary. So we are delighted also to know that now you have taken over as the chairman of the Finance Commission of India recently. And that makes us very proud and a hearty congratulations from Nalanda community. Here. The whole Nalanda community here, sir, is celebrating this visit. All of us know that besides your expertise in your subject, you have been a very prolific writer. Your books, particularly Why Growth Matters, is an acclaimed book. And it has been acclaimed widely. Even the CNN has mentioned about it, that it is a finest publication. India, the emerging giant. India, unlimited. You are writing for the sake of us. We know, sir. Because here, you are trying to explain to us the very roots upon which a country can stand today. It is not just the military might. It is not just the intellectualism and our spirituality and our cultural strength. It is also the economy. And you have made it very clear. Not only through these books, your columns in the newspaper, they bring this fact down to the common person, common readership. I'm happy to share, sir, that whenever we find uh, somebody Everybody finds, in the, in the newspaper, they find your articles published. It circulates amongst the WhatsApp group in this campus with great delight. And we are able to understand so many of the nuances, so many of the finer points about it. I need not say much about your experience and your, your contributions, sir. But I would limit it to Nalanda here. And the finest evidence and the fact here is that during your brief this duration when you have taken over as the chancellor, you have been very seriously engaged in the development of this university. And the, like the three meetings of the governing board that have been convened over just these, this less than one year is is the, is the evidence it shows that how much concern you have for the development of this Nalanda University. Since I am more engaged with you, I understand that most of the time you, in your thoughts, Nalanda is on the top, and you are always thinking how it could be benefited. Sir, I am happy to say that we are trying to fulfill your expectations. We look to your leadership, we look to your guidance, and please, we always would be welcoming all your uh, like suggestions and ideas that you give to us. Here, the students and the teachers and the staff, which is the non-teaching staff, everybody is committed to the growth of Nalanda University. As I welcome you, I have this, I, am with, I think with great satisfaction that I can say, the whole Nalanda community is in front of you. And I can say that everyone here is as much dedicated in his mind. All we look is to the guidance. We look to the inspiration and the encouragement. And that would flow from you because you are the head of this family. Sir. So I welcome you with great honor, with great regard, sir, all from on behalf of everybody here, from the deans, the teachers, 
the students, the non-teaching staff, everybody, a heartiest welcome to you, sir. Thank, Thank you, sir. Thank you, Honorable Vice Chancellor, sir, for your kind and gracious welcome address, reflecting your far-reaching vision for a brighter future of our Nalanda University. Now, ladies and gentlemen, may I take the privilege and honor of requesting and inviting our Honorable Chancellor, Professor Arvind Pangadiaji, for his kind guidance and message. Before I request, sir, for his gracious, gracious remarks, please allow me to inspire our students to briefly acquainting, by briefly acquainting them with your exceptional contributions and achievements. Professor Pangariaji is a globally renowned economist and a professor of economics at Columbia University. He recently got appointed as the chairman of the 16th Finance Commission of India. Professor Pangariya served as the vi first vice chairman of the Niti Aayog from January 2015 to August 2017. During these years, he also served as India's G20 Sherpa and led the Indian team that negotiated the G20 communique. Professor Pangaria holds a PhD degree in economics from Princeton University and has worked in various capacities at the Asian Development Bank, the University of Maryland, the World Bank, IMF, and UNCTAD. Professor Pangaria G is a prolific writer and has authored more than 15 books. His book titled as India, the Emerging Giant was listed as a top pick of 2008 by The Economist and described as the definitive book on the Indian economy by the Fari Zakaria of CNN. The Economist has described his book titled Why Growth Matters as a manifesto for policymakers and analysis. Scientific papers by Professor Pangaria Ji have appeared in the top economic journals such as the American Economic Review, Quarterly Journals of Economics, Review of Economic Studies, and International Economic Review, while his policy papers have appeared in the Foreign Affairs and Poli Foreign Policy. He writes a monthly column in the Times of India, and his guest columns have appeared in Financial Times, Wall Street Journal, and India Today. We have been immensely benefited from your insightful writing, sir. In March 2012, the government of India honored Professor Pangaria Ji with Padma Bhushan, the third highest civilian honors the country bestows in any field. His, accomplish has no, his accomplishments has no limit, and we are indeed very honored to have your presence amongst us. So now, without taking any more time, I would like to request our Honorable Chancellor to kindly address our Nalanda family. Let us all welcome him with a resounding applause. Honorable Vice Chancellor um, and friends, um, you know, this scarf night feels truly nullandized. Um, I can't deliver very long speeches, so just a few words, and then maybe we can have some interactions. Um, all of you also uh, um, uh, ask your questions, and I'll try to answer to the best of my ability. Um, Thanks, Ray, for uh, a lovely introduction. Um, all my accomplishments got uh, uh, listed uh, and narrated there. Uh, but let me just say that, you know, um, we stand on somebody else's shoulders. Uh, and uh, while, you know, we uh, revel in our accomplishments, we should not forget uh, that uh, this is the outcome of what our predecessors did. And uh, I'm reminded, you know, of a conversation I had with my father, you know, when he visited the United States. I had, um, uh, uh, my, I had gone for studies uh, uh, originally to the United States in 1974. So this year in September, uh, it will be 50 years since I left India. Um, he visited me uh, uh, in, in late 1980s. And at that time, I was professor at the University of Maryland at College Park, which was a suburb of Washington, DC. So I gave him a tour of the East Coast. And, and when we were passing you know, in Washington, DC, from outside the White House, uh, he really sort of said, you know, uh, what, what a great accomplishment you have made. You know, you've come all the way to the capital of the world. So my answer to him was that, you know, uh, uh, his own journey 
from the village of Swana, where he was born and raised, uh, to Jaipur was much bigger than my own journey from Jaipur to Washington, D.C. Because once he had actually come out of Swana to Jaipur, uh, the, my journey from Jaipur to the United States was uh, a, a relatively easy one. Um, my father really, you know, not only was born in a village, was born in a village where there was no school. Uh, at five, he lost his father, uh, his mother. Uh, first, at five, he lost his father. At 12 or 13, he lost his mother. Uh, and when he was born, the family was in abject poverty, could hardly afford two meals a day. Uh, and yet, uh, he studied, he uh, found a way to connect himself to the freedom movement. Uh, and in the end, uh, uh, two of his sons ended up uh, winning the Padma Awards. Uh, my brother, who was a neurologist, uh, was awarded Padma Shri, uh, and I was awarded the Padma Bhushan. So really, this is a, an example of how we get better over the future, over the generations. Uh, and, and it is this that we ought to keep in mind, that you know, uh, the progress happens uh, not in one generation, in multiple generations. Uh, Nalanda University, likewise, you know, uh, has been established with great ambition, with great dreams. Uh, 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 originally uh, 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 conceived, the project was conceived by uh, uh, our honorable president at the time, uh, 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 Kalam Azad. And uh, uh, we are carrying on his, his work. Uh, it is a unique project. Uh, uh, it is uh, not under the University Grants Commission. It's not under the Ministry of Education, but it's set up under the Ministry of External Affairs as, uh, an, as an institution of national importance. Uh, and it is an international institution. Uh, uh, most of you are really, very large number of you come from various countries. Uh, and that is really the beauty of this institution. Uh, what we seek really in the longer run uh, is to get, uh, 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 create for Nalanda same reputation that uh, its predecessor institution or the institution which uh, uh, gave rise to this dream uh, uh, had once acquired uh, at, at the time, you know, the old, the ancient Nalanda University was probably the unique institution uh, at its time, there was perhaps nothing like it. There were other universities within India, but globally, I think, you know, there was, you know, when you're talking about starting from 5th century, coming to 12th century, uh, much of Europe uh, really didn't have an institution like Nalanda. Uh, and certainly, the United States was not even there as a country. Uh, uh, and, and the accomplishments of those times uh, in Nalanda, uh, in the fields of study at the time, uh, uh, Buddhism, uh, 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 medical science as it existed at the time, uh, um, uh, various religions uh, were just completely uncomparable. Uh, 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 you know, perhaps the first encyclopedia, uh, uh, which was the encyclopedia of different religions, was written uh, at Nalanda. A lot of this knowledge, of course, this uh, eventually uh, did not. Uh, uh, at least in written form, uh, come down to us, but, but there are records of these things that uh, uh, have been reconstructed. Uh, and, and that is the kind of you know, dream with which we have started this project. Uh, the ancient Nalanda itself uh, uh, was not something that got built in you know, 10 years or uh, 15 years. Uh, it, it started as a vihar uh, initially in the 5th century, to the extent that we know the history of it, uh, to the extent that we can reconstruct it. Uh, it started as a Vihar from then on to Mahavihar, uh, and then many Mahavihars uh, uh, as, as time passed. And it got the patronage of successive rulers, one after the other. Uh, uh, and uh, 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 gradually it grew uh, till, uh, uh, to the best of our knowledge, at its peak. It had 10,000 students, 2,000 faculty. And it was an institution that attracted uh, students from all over the world. Uh, it was uh, not an easy 
uh, 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 run for anybody to get into Nalanda. Uh, 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 they were sort of quote unquote gatekeepers, uh, so that uh, anybody uh, aspiring to join Nalanda had to go through very rigorous uh, scrutiny. Uh, and uh, uh, if we go by the accounts that have uh, come down to us from the uh, Chinese travelers, Wen Sang and Itzing, uh, only one in ten uh, uh, actually made it. So it was that kind of institution, that kind of distinction, uh, and that is what ultimately we should uh, uh, aim to build. Uh, you are all an extremely important part of that journey, that process. Uh, uh, it, it, it is so. You are you are at the beginning of this journey, but we have to end uh, uh, somewhere uh, 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 closer to where uh, the ancient Nalanda was uh, in its uh, intellectual pursuits, in its uh, uh, reputation, uh, in its contributions uh, to the posterity and to the the community uh, uh, around it at the time as well. So that is our ambition. Uh, let us hope we, uh, 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 while I serve as the chancellor, we make some progress, and then we'll have more chancellors uh, uh, to take this institution forward. Uh, uh, but uh, we seek excellence. Uh, we uh, seek reputation for the university. In the end, you know uh, what, uh, uh, where we ought to be able to land is whenever somebody sees a student of Nalanda. They should remark that, ah, she went to Nalanda. Nalanda must be a great university. That is the ambition uh, with which uh, uh, we are working at it. Uh, uh, and let's hope uh, uh, in our uh, own lifetimes, we'll uh, get somewhere close to that. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Sir. We thank you and feel very grateful for your profound and encouraging words and a very enriching message reminding us what set our university apart from all other universities, that it is inspired by its great historic predecessor, ancient Nalanda Mahavihar. I'm sure your words have left an indelible mark on the hearts and minds of our students, guiding us towards a brighter future for our university. Thank you very much, sir. Now, Honorable Sir, with your kind permission, we would like to begin with the interactive session. And indeed, an honored opportunity for, our, for the students of our university. We have received some very good questions. And uh, to begin with, I would like to invite Ms. Kinnery from the School of Historical Studies. Ms. Kinnery, you please ask your question to Honorable Sir. from the School of Historical Studies. Uh, my question for you is that, uh, sir, how do you envision the journey of India towards achieving the status of Vishwaguru or the world leader? And what steps do you believe are essential for realizing this aspiration? Thank you. Well, the first step we need is for Nalanda to become the world-class institution. Uh, but. Uh, um, I think it's a very wide-ranging question, um, uh, uh, and, and uh, I think we are very much on the right path right now. Um, and, and to be at the forefront, uh, what we need to be is, you know, there are two sides, two aspects which I think are very important. One is the economic aspect, and the other is the diplomatic aspect. Uh, there are many others. So, but I will emphasize those two. On the economic aspect, we have to become larger, bigger economy. Uh, we are already about $3.7 trillion, uh, Swiss largest economy. In another three years, I expect that we will be the third largest. Uh, we can you know, talk about it right now. G uh, Germany is the third largest, uh, but at the rate at which we are growing, um, uh, uh, and at the rate at which Germany is likely to grow in the next three years. Uh, I expect that you know by 20, 2026, 27, we will become the third largest. Now, after that, it, 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 it gets tougher. Going back 
right? In a way, when you think of, you know, uh, what what is it, what does it mean for, uh, for the country to be Vishwa Guru or to be, you know, a leading um, uh, a nation, um, for about, you know, a solid one and a half millennia, India was the largest economy in the world. Uh, and from, you know, to the extent that we can have economic estimates, uh, 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 Angus, uh, uh, Madison, uh, 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 an, an economist, of, economic historian actually of great repute, uh, has given the estimates, and and uh, and for about you know one and a half millennia, India was this first the, was the largest economy in the world. For another two decades, it remained um, uh, 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 roughly in that status. Then China became a little bigger, but till as late as 1870. Uh, India and China were the two largest economies in the world. So now I mentioned, you know, we'll become third largest by 2026, 27. Uh, then the, the 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 quest will be to become uh, again the uh, uh, one of the two largest economies of the world. Uh, and that I think will happen, uh, not perhaps in my lifetime, but uh, uh, my own calculations are, and this is all spelled out in great detail in a. A lecture I delivered, uh, this is called the C.D. Deshmukh lecture at uh, the Reserve Bank of India uh, in December 2023. Uh, I, I there argue that, you know, by the time India is 125 years, uh, uh, it will become the second largest economy in the world. So that's one aspect of, of, trying, uh, of the journey to Vishnu Guru. But the other aspect, of course, is also the diplomatic one. Uh, and there, uh, we are on a very strong wicket. As just as we are on the economic side, uh, and that is because we actually are among the rarest of the developing countries which has had a virtually uninterrupted history of democracy for 75 years. And over the years, democracy has deepened. Uh, uh, it, it has faced challenges, but it has always really come up uh, 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 come out of those challenges, come out stronger uh, by meeting those challenges, uh, and, and that journey has gone on. And, and democracy, I think, gives us both a greater moral, moral authority uh, than the authoritarian countries such as China, uh, uh, but, but it also uh, 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 produces uh, better results. It, 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 it helps us take the right decisions. Uh, and, and it is in that context that also uh, uh, we have the prospect of uh, 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 being at the high table in the years to come. We already are there, but but this is going to get uh, only better. And and that I think is 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 our second uh, strength, uh, which will get us there. So that's my sort of bit longish answer. But uh, those are the two, two elements. Thank you, sir. The next question has come from Roshan from School of Language, Literature, and Humanities. Please ask your question. A very good evening, sir. Uh, I am Roshan Yazdani uh, from the School of Language, Literature, and Humanities. Uh, sir, as you have just mentioned, that uh, India has already achieved 3.5 billion, and we know that India is aspiring for 5 trillion uh, US dollar economy. Uh, so, how would you propose the provision of subsidies uh, while ensuring the sustainable economic growth? Say that again. So, uh, how would you propose the provision of subsidies uh, while ensuring the uh, sustainable economic growth and fiscal stability? Okay. Yeah. Thanks. So uh, we are pretty much there, actually, to become a five trillion dollar economy. Uh, uh, as I said, you know, 2026-27, we will become uh, the third largest, and at that time, actually, we'll also become a five trillion dollar economy. Uh, I should really clarify to you that you know you hear this uh, growth rate figure of about seven percent uh, for India. Uh, that is a figure in real dollars. I'm sorry, that's a figure in real rupees. Uh, but what also ha has been happening is, uh, so this is over the last about 20 years time, except if I take the code, that one year, which is the COVID year. If I take that out, then in real rupees, we have grown about 7%. Uh, 
uh, in real rupees. But during this period, rupee has also been appreciating in terms of the dollar. So actually, in real dollars, India has grown uh, at about 8%. And, and if I talk, right, I mean, in the end, when we are doing the international comparisons, we are doing in the current dollars or nominal dollars. In nominal dollars, over the last two decades, India has grown at 10.2%. So that is the rate at which we will be actually expanding. And if you, you know, do a very simple math on $3.7 trillion, uh, an economy growing in current dollars at 10.2% a year, in three years you get to $5 trillion. So that's the first journey to $5 trillion. Uh, and and uh, uh, now, of course, that's pretty much uh, uh, you know, maybe not in three, it'll become four, but, but five trillion is, is about to happen very soon. Um, not on the subsidy issue, I, I, I want to put this in a slightly different context. Now, why do subsidies really exist? Now, what happens is that, look, you know, when economic growth happens, and particularly fast economic growth happens, it always concentrates. There are people who create wealth, and if even they are, if they get to keep, let's say, three or four percent of what well, they create and the rest goes to the other actors in the economy. Even then, at that rate of growth, you very quickly, you know, create a lot of billionaires. So growth in this sense concentrates. Growth also concentrates in urban areas. Uh, typically, you know, uh, uh, industry uh, and services, when they grow rapidly, it is a concentration of it. Uh, and and that what that means is that it, it still creates an imbalance. Now, you can't have a, a $5 trillion economy on the one hand and then a lot of poverty on the other hand. You've got to share that wealth. And the subsidies that you refer to uh, uh, are, are, are essentially in the nature of spreading the wealth that has been created over the entire population. Uh, there are limits to how much subsidies you can give, uh, but most certainly uh, nobody actually resent such subsidies uh, if they are subsidies given to the poor. Now, if the subsidies actually end up in the hands of the rich and relatively wealthier people, uh, that, I think, can lead to resentment. And, and that is something we ought to avoid. Uh, not all subsidies end up going to the poor. Uh, there are examples, easy examples to, to, to find where subsidies can end up going to uh, the, the, the well-off people. Uh, that I think needs to be avoided. Uh, but otherwise, I think, you know, in a democratic uh, country, uh, which is growing at 7% uh, in real rupees or uh, in, at uh, 8 or 8.5% 8 in real dollars, those kinds of subsidies are uh, an essential part of the game. Thank you, sir. Next, we have Piyush from Hindu Studies. Uh, I'm Piyush Kumar from uh, Hindu Studies. Uh, so, uh, sir, my question for you is, uh, sir, in your assessment of the higher education system in India, how do you view the balance between the state intervention and privatization for enhancing the educational outcomes? Thank you. Okay. Now, this is a subject very close to my heart, meaning, you know, higher education system. Um, as regards private institutions, now, you know, they are accepted. If I go back, you know, 20 years, 25 years, um, uh, 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 we hardly had any higher, you know, very rare private institutions of higher education. But today, there are, there's a fairly large number of these institutions. Quite, in, in fact, you know, uh, uh, both private colleges and well, private colleges have existed much longer. Private universities uh, are more or less relatively of more recent origin, you know, with maybe one or two or three exceptions, uh, which which came out earlier. Uh, so, so that part is 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 uh, uh, not uh, a source of worry. Where I feel our higher education system requires a lot more reform uh, is uh, 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 the regulation. I think. Our higher education system is a bit over-regulated. Nalanda actually is a privileged institution. Uh, in, in the way it has been created, it has much greater autonomy. 
uh, and and uh, as chancellor i have certainly fought to retain and preserve that autonomy of the institution because if you're trying to build an institution of excellence uh, autonomy of administration is extremely important uh, now uh, uh, even when i was at the niti io i tried to promote uh, a greater autonomy to, to at least the institutions that were performing well. So as a part of the reform, actually, we started giving much greater autonomy to the best performing colleges. Uh, it, that, that reform still has not gone far enough because there's to be autonomy to the universities also. Uh, sometimes this will require you know, legislative change in India. The universities have been created through legislations either of the state governments or of the central government. Uh, and, and so therefore often, you know, the, uh, further autonomy will require this, this uh, um, uh, legislative change. Uh, there are many aspects now, I'll just give you one or two of those aspects. One, we need to allow the entry of the foreign universities. Uh, I think, you know, the best institutions uh, are not in India currently. If you look at their you know, rankings, pick up any rankings of the universities uh, uh, that, that you can lay your hands on. Uh, whether it's QS or whether it is uh, THES, uh, you'll find that, you know, rarely we would get maybe one or two institutions in the top 200, uh, almost never in top 50. Uh, even, you know, China now has at least two institutions, Peking University and Tsinghua University, which actually rank in the top 25. So we need to get there, and, and that really requires a lot of work. So that's, that's on the excellent side of it. Uh, but Another way to proceed also, uh, so, so foreign universities is, is, is one area which we definitely need to open up uh, so that you know, good institutions from abroad would come in and open campuses here. Uh, you know, in, in the US today, already about something like 300,000 students, 3 lakh students at any point in time are studying in the United States. They spend a lot of money there. Now if the universities were to come here instead, uh, the expense will decline. I mean, even if you spend a fair bit on tuition fees, etc., living expenses will be a lot less, uh, and uh, 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 even the tuition here uh, obviously could be much lower. So even if you know, it, expenses may be a bit more than what uh, 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 they are in the existing Indian institutions. Uh, is still, when you compare it to what these three lakh students are paying in the United States you cut those expenses dramatically, and you improve the access to these really, really distinguished institutions of higher education uh, to a much wider set of students. So that's one thing we need to do. Second, so and, and I'll just stop at that one, uh, is also I feel that you know uh, many of our colleges uh, do very well. They perform very well. You know, you look at um, uh, St. Stephen's, you look at Hindu College, you look at uh, St. Xavier's College. There are many of these colleges, you've got Patna uh, Women's College. Uh, these are colleges which actually are performing extremely well. I think we ought to allow them to give their own degrees. Uh, uh, you know, there ought to be a process by which uh, institutions, college, colleges that is that are performing very well, uh, and, and wish to give their own degrees instead of being, uh, you know, uh, uh, governed by uh, the, their affiliating universities. Right? This is in our system. Every college has to be affiliated to some university. But why? You know, there is no reason why that has to be the case. Colleges that are performing well, producing top-class students, let them give their own degrees. You know, that really allows them to build their own brand. Uh, and uh, 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 it uh, improves competition, right? You know, when, when then the Hindu college would compete against Stephen's, against Sinsevis College, against Patna Women's College, and all. So I think those are some of the things we really need to do uh, to improve uh, the uh, education, particularly quality education. Then there is, of course, important uh, uh, other important issues of linking research to the universities. You know, we have for long put research into these councils. You, you know, the old British model is what we had adopted, but that I don't think has served us very well. Uh, research has to come centrally into the universities so that then there can be links developed uh, on research between the universities and the industry, for example. 
I mean, in the U.S., a lot of the research funds come from the industry, uh, and that is because in the U.S., research is in the universities. Uh, uh, you know, you can't divorce teaching from research. I mean, research and teaching go hand in hand. Uh, and a lot of, you know, my earlier, uh, in my early incarnation, I was a trade theorist, uh, and a lot of the uh, uh, research ideas would come from teaching courses to the very bright students, right? You know, in the end, uh, 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 the younger generation has extremely bright students who come in, and in the course of interacting with them in the classroom, you come up with new research ideas. Uh, and so research, therefore, has to go hand in hand with teaching, uh, and, and that means bringing research centrally into the universities. Uh, I think we're still, I mean, we have made some progress in that direction, but, but I think still institutionally, uh, particularly we, you know, by, by, lead, by creating these sort of councils, which have not themselves really ultimately turned out to be the powerhouses of research, uh, has not served us very well. So that's also something that requires addressing. Thank you, sir. Next we have Shalak from School of Ecology and Environmental Studies. Shalak, please ask your question. I think it's, I mean, Shalom, Shalom, you can come forward and ask your question. Um, all right, so first of all, uh, let's say, so you mentioned two, two, two of these international challenges, climate change and the pandemic. These are both, by the way, international public goods. Uh, that, you know, uh, climate change is a global public good and pandemic, it's not behind us for now, uh, was also a global public bad, you could say. So the fight against it was a global public good. Um, here, Generally, you know, when uh, what the way economists think of it is that when uh, uh, there is a global public good, the uh, the, the uh, solution usually lies at the global level. Um, cooperation has to happen at the global level. Normally, for proper enforcement, of course, you know, if there were a global government, then that global government would actually uh, 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 implement the optimal solution. Um, take climate change, for instance, you're trying to reduce the, uh, the, the carbon in the environment, uh, but that carbon can originate anywhere in the world. Uh, how do we uh, cut that carbon and what is the most efficient way to cut the carbon and how do I do it? Right? So if there was a global government, then it could simply point out that, hey, United States, you are really putting too much carbon. China, you're putting too much carbon. Cut it out this much. Take the policy measures. You can introduce the policy measures, whatever it's a carbon. It could be carbon tax or what have you. Uh, that's the solution you can implement. Unfortunately, there is no global government. So it falls on the national governments. Now, for the national governments, there is a free rider problem. Then why should I do it? They should do it. It's, it's, it's not costless uh, to cut carbon. 
and 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 so therefore the the what is globally optimal is very difficult to implement because you know international diplomacy doesn't go by uh, uh, by uh, uh, good will good international will uh, you act in national interest right and and that is where the problem i mean this is why actually we have, haven't been able to take the actions that are actually required to bring climate change under control <coughs> that that really is the solution now as far as india is concerned in this equation uh, india has done more than its share i would argue is doing more than its share uh, if you look at the existing stock of carbon uh, it's not something that india put it put it up there the largest uh, shares uh, uh, have been you know of the existing stock of carbon uh, is the united states europe china india is maybe fourth but it's uh, uh, it, it's a very low fourth so to say uh, even in terms of the flow if you look at it uh, uh, india is still kind of on the lower side and particularly when you think of india's population if you do it per capita terms india is nowhere in that calculation uh, regardless of that prime minister has an incredible uh, 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 commitment uh, uh, to contributing to 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 the uh, to to the solution uh, of this problem and as a result you know we have really expanded rapidly on solar even very recently uh, you know uh, 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 prime minister uh, declared that you know he has now the plan to uh, put solar panels on the rooftops of 10 million houses uh, there's a huge uh, 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 effort so I, I think India is most certainly doing its share um, and uh, uh, the way I personally think if you ask my view how we should go about doing this is that we should really embed our effort uh, at contribution to the uh, uh, climate change issue by focusing on our own domestic pollution problem our domestic pollution problem is the problem of pollution in the cities if you look at uh, you know global listing of the listing of most polluted cities in the world you know we have the last you know the, i checked this i haven't checked the latest list but when i did about four or five years ago um, out of the 10 most polluted cities in, we had eight out of those 10 cities in, 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 in India. Now that, of course, is we are ourselves breathing foul air. Uh, all through our children are breathing that same foul air, uh, not very harmful for our own health. So the, I think this is, that is the, that is where we ought to focus. So that, you know, uh, 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 our kind of fight against climate change actually contributes to the welfare of our own people here. So that's my, on pandemic, certainly we did extremely well. You know, the, the mighty countries such as the United States really could hardly share their vaccines. Uh, uh, Europeans hardly had any, well, UK did. Uh, uh, but outside of UK, they mean, uh, the continental Europe had hardly any uh, uh, vaccines to share. Uh, and yet we actually, at a very early stage, even when pandemic was still very much active in our country. We shared uh, vaccines with 50 other countries in the very early stage. And then, of course, the numbers had gone up well beyond 100. So uh, 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 in, in this sense, you know, again, this first question that came on Vishwaguru, et cetera, uh, in a way, we have played that role a lot better than countries that could very easily afford to do a hell of a lot more uh, uh, than, than we were capable of doing. Uh, you know, a mighty country such as the United States should have offered actually. And remember, there is a global public problem. Uh, uh, so, if, you know, if, if, uh, if even if you're vaccinating your own population, I'm saying, let's say the, the United States, it doesn't solve the US problem as long as the pandemic is still raging outside the world, it will flow back into your own country. So, it is in your interest also to actually help other countries fight this pandemic. Uh, but I, in, in a sense, the United States there clearly failed. Uh, in contrast, India did a lot better. Uh, and, and, and again, you know, I think the Prime Minister really has that uh, 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 very much uh, 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 um, objective of uh, 
uh, the old Indian tradition of sharing with the other countries, and, and he really made good on, on that. So. Thank you, sir. The next question will be addressed by Ashu from School of Ecology, Environmental and Environmental Studies. Uh, namaste, sir. I'm Ashu Anand from the School of Ecology and Environmental Studies. Sir, my question is to you, sir. How do you envision the future role of Nalanda University on the global stage? Thank you. Well, uh, th that that I said already, right? That you know, when when people see you, they should say that ah, if he's from Nalanda, Nalanda must be a great university. That's a dream. Thank you so much, sir. Okay, next question we received from Lesha from School of Historical Studies. Lesha, please ask your question. Namaskar, respected sir. I am Lesha Piyomi, a PhD student of uh, School of Historical Studies. Actually, I have one question, sir. What potential challenges do you foresee for India in its pursuit of becoming a global power, particularly regarding economic, political and technological advancement. Thank you, sir. Um, that's again a very, very wide ranging question. Um, uh, so let me first take your, uh, you know, economic challenges for India. Um, I mean, the challenge itself is to become is to grow bigger and and uh, 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 raise the per capita incomes of uh, the population. Uh, in in the end, you know, uh, uh, to to be uh, a global power, you need to be a, an economic power uh, as well. So on that, we still have large number of challenges to overcome. We are doing well, but also there are challenges to overcome. Uh, th these are policy challenges. Um, uh, but but you know I'll, I'll point out maybe a couple of these challenges to, uh, to you uh, in, in a slightly different form and then come to the policy challenges. Um, one of the big challenges you know that we face is that as far as per capita incomes and the GDP are concerned, I, I, I think we are on the path to do it. Uh, we are already you, I spoke about it earlier in the answers to some of the other questions. Uh, but uh, there is a different transformational challenge, which is the following. Uh, about 45% of India's workforce currently is still in agriculture. About 40% uh, is in micro and small enterprises. Now, if you look at the labor productivity in either agriculture or in these micro and small enterprises. Now, when I say micro and small enterprises, what these are enterprises with less than 10 workers each. So the output per worker, whether it's agriculture or these micro and small enterprises, is really small. And this goes back to, right, you know, when I said that, out, that output tends to concentrate. Either somebody creates wealth, and, and so it, that is concentration, concentration, or growth concentrates in certain urban agglomerations or regions, then it concentrates. Uh, it, it is also concentrating actually in terms of some enterprises, very large enterprises. You know, think of the petroleum refining, uh, petroleum refineries of uh, uh, Reliance, big India's biggest exporter, pretty much is is is, is uh, refined petroleum, um, and and what what this has meant is that you know. Uh, 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 at the end of the day, a very vast population is still what we would say vast workforce is still underemployed. Underemployed in the sense that they don't have enough capital as a result of which output per worker is relatively small. Another way to think of it is that a job that uh, with reasonable amount of capital can be done by one person is being done by two or three or four. Um, you know, you just think about it, you know, if you. Uh, a, a, a simple like a plumber when comes in, maybe come with two other assistants and uh, not enough tools with him, uh, and and then struggle with the tools uh, that w w which are not not the best of the tools. Uh, he'll do the job because he's skillful and all, 
but it takes time. And that with better tools, one person could come in and do that job in, in probably one third the time that it takes that person. So, so that's, a, that's, that's a challenge, how to create jobs uh, 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 that, would be high, that would be higher productivity jobs and therefore would pay higher wages. So that, you know, this subsidy, this redistribution that you have to do through subsidies and all uh, would not have to be done, right? People will earn their own incomes. That is a challenge. Another way to see this challenge is the following. That if you look, for example, India's, uh, this is from 2011 census, um, uh, because we haven't had a census since then, so that's the last one we have. Um, about 52 or 53 percent of uh, uh, India's population, uh, which is also about 75 percent of the rural population, lives in villages of less than 3,000. Right? So these are habitations that are relatively small. But that's where more than half of your population is sitting. Now through this kind of subsidy or through this redistribution, you can bring electricity to them, you can bring water to them, you can bring toilets to them, you can bring uh, uh, roads to them. But what after that? How through, I mean, I through re redistribution through subsidies, I cannot possibly bring an automobile to them, I cannot possibly bring a refrigerator to them, I cannot possibly bring a washing machine to them. But in the end, high living standards are associated with all those things that I have named. And, and it is a challenge, therefore, you know, for India, how do I solve this problem? Because 3,000 habita habitations of 3,000 will not bring me the industry there. No industry will locate there. In the end, people have to move. And, and this migration out of these low productivity jobs, whether they're in agriculture, micro and small um, enterprises, uh, basically requires people to move out of these smaller habitation to larger ones. Not everybody has to move, but some have to, so that the, bur so that the burden on the land is reduced. Uh, today, the land per worker in agriculture available is very small. You need some workers to move out of that land, therefore, thereby in increasing the land available per worker in agriculture so that the productivity in agriculture rises. And, and the folks who move out of agriculture and therefore out of these smaller habitations also have better prospects better employment opportunities. Uh, and that's what we really need to do. That's where I think a big challenge uh, still remains. So that's on the, that's illustrative of the economic challenges that we still have. In spite of growing at a good pace and globally, therefore earning huge amount of respect uh, uh, because you know countries that are economically prosperous and, and, and uh, uh, economically large get respect. I think that's, that's, that's the way, that's the world we live in. Uh, politically, I think, of course, we have done very well. Democracy is one very important aspect of it. But lately, I think diplomatically also, we have positioned ourselves very well. And one of the things we have done, I think this is the great Indian tradition, that uh, uh, we have generally not uh, reacted in uh, forging our relationships with other nations uh, 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 by reacting to purely short-term interests. I think we have demonstrated that we stand for long-term friendships and that we honor our long-term friendships. So even though, you know, in the Ukraine-Russia conflict, for instance, uh, the, the, there was this very strong sentiment that, uh, uh, oh, Russia was evil for having invaded Ukraine, uh, we took a more nuanced approach to that. Uh, because Russia had been a very long-term friend of India, and when uh, in, uh, in, in the India-Pakistan conflict, uh, Russia had been India's, uh, uh, Russia or before that the Soviet Union, had been uh, extremely supportive of India. This was a very, very long-term relationship, so India could not, uh, you know, being, the tr it, given India's own old tradition, India couldn't have abandoned a very long-term friend just like that. Uh, it, it, in this sense, India is not, uh, a, a purely transactional country in, in, in its relationships with the other nations. And I think that's a big strength of India. Uh, and and uh, uh, so on, on diplomatic front, I would continue on that path. Thank you, sir.
Next will be asked by Nandita from School of Ecology and Environmental Studies. Good evening, sir. Uh, sir, can you elaborate the initiatives aimed at fostering innovation and entrepreneurship in India, particularly among the youth? Thank you, sir. That's your job. You have to do the innovation. <laughs> no, I think India's youth are doing very well. You know, uh, we uh, have uh, uh, produced a, an, an extremely um, uh, 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 strong ecosystem for the growth of, uh, uh, particularly when you look at the startups, uh, you know, a lot of the innovations today, well, a lot of the innovation with commercial application uh, 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 is happening. Uh, why are there startups? And India uh, has, you know, according to experts, I'm not, this is not my area, so I'm not an expert in this area, but according to experts, uh, we have the third best uh, uh, ecosystem for the growth of the um, uh, startups uh, and uh, some of the very impressive large startups uh, have come out of India. Uh, you know, it's, we have been producing these unicorns, uh, uh, you know, enterprises with uh, uh, an evaluation of a billion dollars or more. Uh, it's a rough road, so we have also seen some of the, you know, uh, uh, major uh, unicorns uh, uh, bite the dust, but that's the nature of the game. I think you know that's how uh, the, you, you take risks, you uh, uh, succeed, but then you can falter too. Uh, but uh, uh, ultimately, you have to get up, and others have to come in, uh, and a lot of that innovation is is happening. Where I feel you know um, uh, we are uh, not doing um, very well in on innovation is. In the existing corporations, the the investment in R and D by our corporations is is really very tiny. I mean, you know, uh, compared to other countries such as South Korea, China, Taiwan, uh, you know, uh, uh, and of course the European countries as well as the United States, uh, our investment in R and D is very small, and and uh, this is particularly. Uh, uh, well, particularly the industry, uh, meaning the large corporations, uh, uh, have, have not invested enough there. Um, part of it, it also requires actually, you know, the exposing the corporations uh, uh, and our enterprises to competition, foreign competition. Uh, and uh, I think policy is somewhat responsible there that we have uh, tried to shield them from competition by imposing all sorts of uh, high protectionist tariffs. Um, we need to open up a bit more, uh, subject them to uh, global competition, uh, and that I think generally creates innovation. I mean, I like to use you know the the analogy with the, the sports. Think of cricket game. If if uh, if you are not playing the test cricket and if you're not playing the you know uh, 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 the, the World Cup cricket and say ah you know I'm just you, not going to, I'm going to shield my players from that kind of competition, which is so intense, and, and I'm just going to, to you know, uh, uh, have my competition among the states and among my universities and so forth. Uh, you'll not, not very likely that you'll produce so many world-class cricket players. The mere fact that, you know, they have to play in uh, IPL, they have to play in World Cup cricket, the I-20, um, uh, whatever, you know, all the, all the international cricket, uh, has brought you know the the cricket players from all corners of India, uh, you know from what used to be a game of the elite only, uh, it has really become the game of the common person in India. Uh, look at the background of the cricket players who are coming, you know, from rural areas, from states like Jharkhand, from you know what was Delhi, Bombay kind of axis. Uh, has not yielded all the space to these players who are coming from, you know, remote corners of India. And this is the same with industry, you know. Uh, subject them to competition. You have to, uh, you know, when you compete against the best in the world, you got to paddle very hard to survive. And, and that brings out the best in you. Uh, uh, it is 
in my own field, right, or in research, for example, uh, those of us who operate in the global marketplace, meaning, you know, you, uh, 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 your peer group is defined to be those who are at the frontier of research uh, forces you to work uh, very hard. But if you think, you know, okay, as long as I'm doing okay among my own colleagues, among, within my own university, I'm happy. Um, well, then you don't produce that kind of work. So these are the challenges we have to face. Thank you, sir. Next, we have Avnish from Hindu Studies. Namaste, sir. I am Avnish from Hindu Studies. Uh, sir, you just mentioned about India's uh, diplomatic strategy. Uh, sir, how do you see uh, India leveraging its soft power and cultural diplomacy to further enhance its international influence and strengthen its bilateral ties with other countries? Thank you, sir. The soft power has as many different dimensions. You know, you got Bollywood on the one hand, then you got the Indian diaspora on the other, um, you got cricket, uh, whatnot. So there are many different aspects, and these are all contribute. I, I, you know, in the in the end, uh, um, uh, these are all ways in which uh, uh, you change the perceptions of the other countries. Uh, and and I would say, being myself uh, uh, an expat Indian living in the United States for the better part of my life. Um, I, I think the Indians who are living in the United States and Europe, etc., uh, have been very instrumental in uh, changing the perceptions. You know, when people see that, well, the first generation of Indians who arrived in the, and since my familiarity is bet more with the United States, I will speak to, to that. Um, you know, first generation of Indians were predominantly doctors, medical doctors who arrived. And uh, the, the, you know, contact of the general population as far as Indians were concerned was largely through the doctor, right? You know, so practically every, uh, in the 60s and 70s, one in two or three families had encountered an Indian doctor. Uh, uh, and, and so the perceptions of India, of Indians were very different uh, than let's say perceptions of the Mexicans who crossed the border. Uh, uh, came in as illegal aliens and so forth. Uh, 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 and, and then over time, of course, in various industries, the tech industry, the edu education, you know, there's hardly any top university uh, and any, hardly any top department uh, of a top university where Indian faculty members are not present. You know, so that again, uh, uh, to the younger population, they see the Indians as, as, as being um, their professors. Uh, tech industry, you all know, it's pretty much today dominated heavily by Indians. Uh, and, and all that is part of the um, Indian soft power as well. So I, I, I think we, uh, and, and the, the perceptions in this sense uh, of the Indians have been quite different. We are very well accepted also uh, as opposed to many other uh, nationalities uh, uh, in, in, in the foreign countries. Uh, we are not seen as model citizens. Um, so all that helps, um, uh, and, and all that has a role to play, uh, and, and uh, ultimately that uh, also feeds into the diplomacy. By the way, also in the United States now, a lot of Indians have also gotten into politics, you know, the second and third generation Indians who, who are the citizens of the United States. Uh, but uh, at least, you know, the love of the country in some form remains at least till the, uh, the, the, the second and third generation. Uh, I think eventually, of course, the, it dissipates. Uh, but certainly, you know, for my children, for example, India remains a, a very important connect. Uh, and, and so that also gives us, in an indirect way, uh, 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 an entree uh, more directly into the political system. Uh, of the of of the in India sympathizers. So these are various ways that uh, the soft power of India plays out. Thank you, sir. Uh, next, we have Srishti from School of Management Studies. Uh, 
Uh, good evening, sir. Myself, Tristy from the School of Management Studies. Uh, so my question is, how do you envision bridging the gap between education and employment opportunities in India, especially for the youth, uh, to foster economic growth and development? Thank you. Um, in the end, you know, this is something I dealt with in, uh, in a slightly different context earlier, uh, that uh, our industrial structure also has to become more jobs-oriented. Um, so let me put it this way today, you know, uh, put it a bit more dramatically, that India's capital is sitting in these very highly capital intensive industries. I mentioned one, which was petroleum refining. But if you look at the other machinery industry, you look at IT industry, you look at uh, um, uh, finance industry, uh, you look at pharmaceuticals industry, these are our successful industries. Um, capital is sitting there, but not a lot of workers are sitting there. On the other hand, workers are sitting in these micro, small enterprises, um, agriculture. Uh, not much capital there. So, so vast part of the workforce is working with very little capital. Vast part of the capital is working with very little labor. That is your employment challenge. And, 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 and this is where uh, the economic, it, it is this industrial structure uh, which, which is unique among countries that grow at 7, 8%. You know, uh, if, if you look at the other countries like, um, uh, South Korea and Taiwan and Singapore in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, or China later on, more recently Vietnam also. These rapidly growing economies often have an economic structure, structure where capital sits where labor is. So, you know, clothing industry, apparel industry, footwear industry, uh, 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 furniture industry, all kind of light manufacturing, you know, things like uh, 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 your kitchenware and whatnot. So that's where labor and capital come together. And somehow our industrial structure has been um, very highly capital and skilled labor intensive. I mean, when we, we think you know, that the tech industry can really solve our jobs problems. Sometimes we take that view. But even in the US where the tech industry is so incredibly large, it employs probably 5 million people. In India, maybe it does five or six million people, but India's workforce is like 500 million plus. You can't, even when you think of uh, uh, tourism, for example, tourism employs at best one and a half percent of uh, the workforce. Um, construction is one which, which, which employs a bit more. I think that's one industry um, which, which does create reasonable jobs uh, and, and in reasonable numbers. But other than that, I think our structure, so, so there has to be some restructuring. It really is a long history of restrictions in the system. Even now, the labor laws are very restrictive in India, which discourages uh, the, uh, the entry of these companies into very labor-intensive activities. So I think, to me, that's where the solution ultimately would have to come from. Uh, because otherwise, if we say that through education, we'll gradually absorb them in these jobs that are, um, you know, uh, services oriented jobs or uh, uh, jobs that are largely, you know, very few. I mean, just think, for example, auto industry, where, where we think that there's a lot of employment or we look at two wheelers, uh, the, the motorcycles and so forth. Labor costs are about 4% of their total costs. They're not employing, you know, when it comes to per unit uh, production, uh, labor is only 4% in value terms. So. Uh, this is, I think, uh, the, the challenge. Unemployment is not very large in India, by the way. If you look at the uh, periodic labor force survey, which uh, puts out these numbers, uh, even urban unemployment, if you want to think only of urban unemployment, uh, it is not a very large number, maybe 6%, 7%. Uh, so everybody is doing something. But, but uh, th these are not the jobs which pay very well. And that, I think, to me, this underemployment, as the economists would say, uh, um, uh, low productivity employment, that's a problem that really we need to solve. Uh, and for that, I think personally that 
some kind of restructuring of the of, of the economy will have to happen, and that in turn means that you know some of the policies need to we need to open up the economy wider. We need to uh, fix the labor laws. Um, uh, 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 also, land in India tends to be very expensive, uh, which means that you know, for industries, for manufacturing industries, which require land, um, it, 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 it's a difficult uh, task to enter because you know, often any large company will require 100 acres, 150 acres of land to start to start a large-scale company, uh, and if you can't get land uh, of, uh, of that size, there is a challenge. So these are challenges. We have been working on these. I think things are a lot better today than they were 15 years ago, uh, but still some ways to go. Thank you, sir. So now, with your kind permission, we'll take the last uh, last question for today's interaction, and it will be asked by Ankit from School of Buddhist Studies, Philosophy and Comparative Religion. Uh, namaste, sir. Uh, I am Ankit from the School of Buddhist Studies. Uh, sir, my question is, uh, as a digital governance becomes increasingly prevalent, what steps are being taken to safeguard individual privacy, rights will maximizing the efficiency and transparency of government operations? Thank you, sir. Sorry, this, was, this was the question about digital? Yes, yes. yes sir. Yes. Okay. So, I'm a little surprised. Why have all the questions come from this side and none from this side? <laughs> okay. Uh, um, all right. So, on, on digital, I'll just give you a sort of my broad answer. Uh, um, uh, uh, India actually, particularly the on, on the public digital infrastructure, India is a pioneer. Uh, uh, the, the, the system that India has designed, uh, probably no other country has, has done it. And, and, and perhaps a lot of the countries will do themselves a favor by copying the Indian public digital uh, uh, infrastructure. Uh, I'm referring to the UPI, uh, 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 but, but also some of the other aspects of it, you know, through Aadhaar, uh, then the UPI serving as the uh, negotiator between the various transactors, in, uh, you know, that, that everybody has the bank account, uh, and these banks are on the UPI platform. Um, today, you know, I can transfer money to anybody in India in real time, uh, just like that. Uh, in the US, in contrast, if I have to transfer money from my own account into another account at another bank, it takes a while. You know, um, so, 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 but in other areas also, the digitization has progressed very rapidly. The government, you know, all the uh, uh, um, uh, uh, government decision making has gone digital. Uh, so it speeds up the processes. Um, the various platforms that now exist uh, uh, you know for things things for which you had to actually go to an office uh, if it's a birth certificate or a death certificate or your pension this that the vast number of these things are not digitized you don't have to go anywhere you can do it with a few clicks um, so ease of living as the prime minister calls it has dramatically improved um, uh, um, so I, I think overall in India's uh, digital platforms, uh, which, which are not, as I said, you know, think of all the transfers that the government is able to do. It's very, very impressive, you know, with one click, bang, you know, uh, 6,000 or 2,000 rupees uh, 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 three times a year uh, are transferred to the accounts of so many uh, farmers. You know, this, this, uh, this PM Kisan uh, uh, transfer of funds. It happens just like that. Uh, the entire public finance management system, PFMS of the government of India, uh, where now, uh, you know, uh, uh, in the past, for example, uh, uh, the money would get transferred for spending from, let's say, central government to the state government. But then, central government has borrowed whatever, you know, either 
collected the tax or it has borrowed the money to transfer it to the state and then it sits with the state. Interest is being paid but it takes a long while before the money gets used but not through the PFMS system, you don't have to do that. The payment happens as soon as the spending happens, as soon as the demand is made that I'm ready to spend, then the money gets transferred. So you don't have to, you know, uh, uh, let the money sit idle. <laughs> so, number of these things, and, <coughs> and this has also helped improve the transparency. The, the Prime Minister's office runs this, uh, uh, you know, public grievance system, which is also on digital platform. You can send your complaint to the Prime Minister's office and you'll get a reply, you'll get a response. Uh, it's, it's quite impressive actually and that's also being done uh, through digital platforms. So, a lot of progress has happened. Uh, uh, um, in, in fact, I would argue that, you know, this, uh, to, to some degree, <coughs> our industry has been behind or has, has not matched uh, 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 the government's efforts in, in, in this direction, you know, if you look at it <coughs> in terms of in, uh, uh, innovation in the digital space, our industry has perhaps lagged a bit. I mean, take the example of TikTok, <coughs> right? It was something that had existed. It, there was a clear market for TikTok. Then at some point, uh, uh, because of the security considerations, the government of India banned TikTok. There was a great opportunity for private entrepreneurs to actually produce an app which could have been the successor to TikTok. But in the end, that space was taken by Facebook, you know, the shorts of by the Facebook that have taken the space that uh, TikTok had created, uh, that, that, that the ban on TikTok uh, had created. Our entrepreneurs really did not actually take advantage of that. Um, so, so, so I would, if anything, like to see our own industry uh, uh, to, 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 to perform better actually in the digital space than it has done so far. Thank you so much, sir. So this was the last question for today's interactive session, hoping to have many such eminent sessions in future as well. So your responses were indeed so captivating that I was almost forgetting my role as moderator. And let us all express our deepest gratitude to the Honorable Chancellor, sir, for sharing his profound wealth of wisdom with our students that will continue to inspire, empower them long into the future. Okay, now it's the time for expressing our gratitude through delivering a vote of thanks. And on behalf of Nalanda University, I express our heartfelt gratitude and thank to our Honorable Chancellor, Professor Arvind Pangadiaji, whose sagacious leadership has guided our university to greater heights. We thank you for sharing your wealth of profound wisdom and vast experience, as well as for being so generous and kind in responding to all the questions from our students, encouraging and guiding them towards not only meet and set the bar of academic excellence, but also to become a better and responsible citizen. Your distinguished service and concern in the pursuit of ex academic excellence merit our deepest appreciation and gratitude. I also like to thank our Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor Abhay Kumar Singh Ji, for his kind guidance and consistent encouragement to all the members of Nalanda family, as well as his astounding leadership and far-reaching vision in enhancing and expanding the academic excellence of our Nalanda University. We also thank our respected registrar, sir, Dr. Ramesh Singh Pariharji, for his unwavering dedication and tireless guidance to the entire Nalanda team for making this event a success. Li lastly, I thank the entire Nalanda family, our most respected deans, family, faculty members, administrative and other of university officials and staff and last but not the least to our dear students for their wonderful interaction and participation. Thank you very much. Thank you one and all. Wishing you a very good evening.